Today we're in 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to look today at verses 11 and 12 as we continue going through our study here in 1 Timothy. So let's begin reading together at verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 11. And we'll read verses 11 and 12 and we'll get into our, uh, our study today. So beginning at verse 11, 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul writes, But you, O man of God, Flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So Paul has been instructing Timothy. As we've been going through 1 Timothy, we know that. Paul has been instructing Timothy concerning a variety of things. And in this chapter, he's been sharing with Timothy concerning false teachers. And uh, he actually, in verses 4 and 5, had begun to outline some of the characteristics of false teachers who were entering into the church and were influencing it. And he said there are certain traits that you can identify them by. He said they are proud. They're unwilling to receive good teaching. They have no knowledge of truth. He said they're argumentative, filled with envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions. He said they think that godliness is something that they can financially profit from. So he's been speaking concerning these things. And so one, he's saying these are the, uh, the ver- uh, various traits, the visible traits of false teachers. But in contrast, Timothy Uh, You're to do something different. And that's what he's saying in verse 11 when he says, you, O man of God, flee these things. Flee the things that he's been speaking about and do something different. He says, pursue righteousness. So in contrast, Timothy is to flee these things and he's to pursue righteousness because Timothy, in contrast to false teachers, is a man of God. So notice how he said that. He said, you, O man of God, man of God, What does that speak about? Well, a man of God is one in God's service. A man of God is somebody who represents God and speaks in the name of the Lord. In the Old Testament, when you read that term, man of God, the title man of God speaks of a person who's entrusted with a high office. You see men spoken of as men of God. For example, Psalm 90 is referred to as a prayer of Moses, the man of God. King King David is referred to as David, the man of God, in 2 Chronicles 8, 14, and Elijah, in 2 Kings 1, verse 9, is referred to as man of God. And so in the Old Testament, the title man of God spoke of a person who was entrusted with a high office. In the New Testament, every believer is recognized as holding a high office and anointed by the Spirit, and every genuine Christian could be regarded as a man or a woman of God. You see that in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where Paul says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so in the New Testament, when you're born again, you're called into the service of the Lord. When the Holy Spirit anoints you, you are regarded as a woman or a man of God and should therefore live in such a way. So God has placed Timothy in in an important position. Timothy is the pastor of the church. And in that context, Paul would refer to him as man of God. He's reminding him when he refers to him that way in verse 11, you old man of God, he's reminding him that uh, it is his responsibility to serve the church properly. And so... As a man of God, verse 11, notice that Timothy is to flee some things in order to pursue other things. Now, he's to flee from the things that Paul mentioned in verses 4 and 5. Once again, he's to flee pride, disputations, arguments over words, envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings, and the greedy manipulation of people's religious faith for personal financial gain. You see, Paul's constant admonition is for believers to make the practice of fleeing from sin. 
instead of being attracted to it, they're to flee it. And they're not to give any room for a temptation to failure. You see, a godly person realizes that there are some things that should be avoided at all costs. There are certain sins that Paul actually names and says we're to flee from when you read your scriptures. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, Paul said, flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. In 1 Corinthians 10, 14, he writes, My dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. And in 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, flee also youthful lust. So you flee fornication, flee idolatry, flee youthful lust. He's saying these are the things that you're to flee. The man of God is to flee the things that are associated with a variety of things, especially and including he is to flee from the things that are associated with greed. Again, remember the false teacher manipulates people in order to financially gain from them. And when you read the Bible, you see that that's true in both the Old and the New Testament. There are people who profited off of the people in the name of God. You see an Old Testament man by the name of Balaam who did just that. In the New Testament, you see someone like Judas or a man by the name of Demas, who Demas, the scripture says, loving this present world, has left. He walked away from the faith because he loved the things that he could get from this present world. So you have people in the Old as well as the New Testament who are models of people who are greedy and pursuing the wrong things. But on the other hand, you have a man in the Scriptures, and many of them really, but you have one man, for example, Paul, who's an example of a genuine servant of God. And he could speak of himself in this way. In Acts 20, verses 30, uh, 33 through 35, this is what Paul could say. He said, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me in everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So flee these things and follow after something else. Remember in verses 9 and 10, how Paul said, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. He went on to say, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And then he moves on and says, but you, in contrast to the false, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. And so he's to flee certain things and pursue other things. Paul is saying, listen, you're a pastor. As a pastor, you pursue certain things. Now the word pursue means to seek after something eagerly, to earnestly endeavor to acquire something. And Paul lists six Christian virtues for him to pursue. It's not temporary, by the way. It's something for him to pursue over a lifetime. What is it that you're to pursue? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. And so he begins with, and we'll look at these individually, he begins with pursuing righteousness. Now, righteousness simply means doing what is right in the sight of God and man. That's righteousness. You're doing what is right. Now, righteousness speaks of an outward holiness that is recognizable as an evidence of salvation. Righteousness results from a love for the Lord and an obedient heart. It, it results when we yield ourselves to the Lord. Again, it is an outward holiness that is making you recognizable as a follower of Jesus Christ. A while back, Marie and I, my wife and I, we're at a restaurant in the area. And I was seated with her. And a couple tables away, there were several people, uh, several women and a man, seated maybe two, three tables away. The restaurant was relatively empty at that time. And so I could hear them. They were talking and talking, loud, talking loudly. And the, the man was, was drinking, you know, at lunch he was drinking. And sometimes when people drink, and the more they drink, the louder they get. It's like they go deaf, and they have to talk loudly. So 
he was drinking till he got real deaf. And as he was speaking, he started using a lot of profanity. And, and I'm one of these husbands that, that I don't like my wife being around it. If anybody's going to cuss at her, it's going to be me. No, I, 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 I just don't like that. I just, it's just not proper. And so she didn't notice it, you know, but I did. And I could hear him, and he just keeps going on and on, a little more to drink, a little more profanity. And it's real loud. And he's using some real bad words. But my wife's not aware of it, but I am. And I'm getting uncomfortable. So I begin to think, maybe I should go over there and tell him it's improper the way you're speaking. But at the same time, I'm thinking, what if he jumps up and hits me? (laughs) So, you know, I think... So I tell Marie, could you go tell... No, um, <laughs> he's offending my sensitive ears. No, I... So I, I know, I'm watching my wife. She's not responding. She doesn't hear him. I don't know why. We continue our conversation, but I can still hear this guy. Until he says this. He says, I don't want to go out with anybody right now because I'm born again. I'm a born again Christian and I cannot date someone because if they don't know Jesus, we'll be unequally yoked. And I'm looking at him, <laughs> and I'm thinking, my goodness. See, the Bible says that we're to pursue this, this, this outward demonstration that you actually know the Lord. You're to flee certain things and pursue righteousness. That is right action before man. It's right action before God. It means that your life is is a living proof of your faith. That's what it means. It's not enough for me to say I believe certain things, in other words. The things that I believe will be evident by the way I live. So naturally, as a pastor, Paul is speaking to Timothy, and he's saying to him, in essence, listen, you flee these things. Flee these things that I just... uh, spoke to you about, and pursue these other things. And the first thing on this particular list, Timothy, that I want you to, to pursue is pursue righteousness. Uh, pursue a, a life that has an outward evidence that you have a relationship with me. Again, it's, it's something that results as we yield ourselves to the Lord. In Romans chapter 6, verse 13, it says, Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Yield yourselves. In other words, you don't present yourself as an instrument of unrighteousness, but you yield yourself to God, alive from the dead, that you might live as an instrument of righteousness. You see, evil is to be overcome, and it is overcome by good. In Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So somebody said, the man of God tosses away covetous desires and presses after righteousness. So he says, pursue righteousness. Then he says, the man of God is to pursue godliness. Now, godliness is an inward kind of work. It it speaks of the devoted life. It speaks of a person's attitudes as well as their motives. Uh, It speaks of reverence for God, the kind of reverence that flows out of a devoted, worship-filled heart. The man of God is to pursue godliness. And again, notice that Paul makes it clear it's to be pursued. Godliness does not simply happen automatically. It's the result of spiritual discipline. It's something that you're pursuing It's something that you discipline yourself towards. We already saw that in chapter 1, uh, rather chapter 4 here in 1 Timothy in verses 7 and 8, where Paul had said, reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Godliness. Godliness is a sincere devotion to God. Our affections are are given to Him. Our way of life is motivated by Him. 
Godliness is the result of a heart that longs for the Lord. It's, it's a heart that wakes up saying, I just want to be closer to the Lord. Now, by the way, that's not, that's not a, an unusual life in, in the way that some think of Christianity today. They think, well, there's certain people that have that kind of life, and there are others that just, eh, it's not that important to them. No, this is something that is supposed to be true for all of us. That's how you got saved. That's how you got saved in the first place if you're a believer today is that you had a hunger for something deeper than what you have. And that's what motivates you for a lifetime. In Psalm 42, verse 1, the psalmist said, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. There's a hunger and a thirst within me. And so he says, pursue these things. Pursue righteousness, he said. Pursue godliness. That speaks of your spiritual discipline. And then third, he says, pursue faith. Faith is a confident trust in God for everything. Faith speaks of a life of faith revealed in every aspect of the way that you live. Faith is, is living. It's a vital relationship to God through Jesus Christ, His Word, and by the Holy Spirit. Faith is something that you determine to hold fast to when everything in this world is trying to, to take your grip away from you. Faith is something you hold fast to. It's something that you walk in. It's something that you live in. It's something that you grow in. It, it, is, it is learning to put your trust in the Lord. In Psalm 31, verse 1, it says, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. In Luke 18, 27, Jesus said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And so what we learn is that God is the God of the possible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to make me more than victorious. I am going to be able to do those things that He has commanded me to do. Why? Because He's given to me the power by the Holy Spirit and the instruction by His Word. He's given to me a family that encourages me. There's a great, great uh, amount of people that are encouraged to us to walk in the things of the Lord. I can do it. So I pursue faith. I want to grow in my faith and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to have a relationship with him that grows deeper and deeper to trust him for greater and greater things. And so he says, follow the Lord and pursue faith. Hold confidently to God for everything. The enemy whispers in your ear and says to you, it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. The enemy whispers, amen, the, 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 it's true. It, it's, it's true that the, he whispers and he says to you, you can't do that, you're not going to make it. Look at you, look at what you've been, look at how you are. And you know what? What I was is not what I am. And what I am is not what I'll be. My God is able. And my God will work through me. My God will strengthen me. My God will never leave me. My God enables me. My God is victorious. I am victorious in Him. What will the enemy do to me? Nothing. He cannot be victorious over me. And you know that. And you know that because the Word of God teaches that. God is with you. He doesn't leave you. He will not forsake you. And you can overcome through him. And you pursue him over a lifetime. He says, pursue love. As a minister, Timothy, you need to love. Now this love that he speaks about is an unrestrained love for God. It's love for others. It's love for the lost. Determine that you're going to love. Someone once said, love is not simply something you feel. It is something that you do. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. Love is what demonstrates that we are truly Christians. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. He said that's the birthmark, that's the evidence, that's the clear evidence that you know the Lord is that your life is changed and you become someone who actually loves other people. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. There are those who want to be ministers, but they don't love people. And he's saying that's not how it works. You love people because God loves people. And it demonstrates that you have relationship with Him. It's interesting. I, I read on Facebook and uh, Facebook Live right now. We're on Facebook Live. You guys ought to be in church. But anyway... Um, <laughs> 
You'll read on, uh, people will write things on Facebook how that they were at a gas station and someone rudely pushed in front of them or they're out Christmas shopping and, and uh, somebody cut in line and, and then they complain and uh, it, it's, it's, it's a whining session and all. And, and uh, I understand frustration, by the way. I understand that. It's not like I don't get frustrated and all I do. But we, we post it. We want everybody to know how upset we are over certain things and all. But I, I, on, I honestly and constantly I have to ask myself one question. Why do I expect non-believers to act like believers? Why do I expect the world to act like Christians? I get more concerned because a lot of times Christians act more like the world. And so for me, you know, I, I'm not surprised when somebody is standing in line in front of me and then invites two or three of their friends to get. I'm not surprised by that. I'm not surprised that you're trying to turn into a parking space and someone cuts in front of you like that. I'm not surprised because they do that, because people do that. I'm not surprised when people steal your credit card and use it to buy Christmas gifts for other people. I'm not surprised by that, because people do that. And yet the church seems to get surprised when the world acts like the world. The world actually gets surprised when Christians act like Christians. And so we have to pursue these things because it's not easy. It is not easy to love rude people, is it? You know, it isn't. It's Christmas. You'll be with them tonight. <laughs> and tomorrow. I mean, family gets together. We can be rude to one another. That's what we do, and we do it well. Why do we get surprised? So I actually have to pray and pursue love. I have to pursue faith. I have to pursue godliness. I have to pursue righteousness. I have to pursue that. It's something I'm disciplined to and in pursuit of because it isn't natural for me to have any of that. And so love, again, is not simply you feel. It's something that you do. Then he says, pursue patience. Hold fast to the Lord. Hold fast to Jesus through every trial. Hold fast to him through every disappointment. Because patience is a very tangible evidence of a genuine faith. In, in Psalm 40, verse 1, the psalmist said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me, heard my cry. God doesn't always answer my prayers the second that the words leave my mouth. There are times that my prayers are, they, they seem like they're just almost useless. I keep praying and praying and praying, and weeks and sometimes months and even years go by. And you think, Lord, do you hear my cry? And yet the psalmist makes it very clear. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined. So you hold on. It's an evidence that you trust the Lord, and God has a perfect timing for everything. It's a steadfastness, whatever the cost may be. It's an unswerving and unwavering loyalty to Jesus Christ. Psalm 57, verse 7 said, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. I'm holding fast and I'm not letting go. I'm trusting you and your will will be done. And that is something that you pursue. And then you pursue gentleness. The word gentleness speaks of meekness. It's a kindness of spirit. It, it, it refers to the mild treatment of other people. Now in context, he had just been speaking about the false teachers who, who rip people off and teach them things to profit off of them. So somebody said, generally, it is pride that motivates people to long to be rich and great at any cost. In contrast to this, Timothy is to possess meekness as he instructs the church, as he refutes error, and as he reproves and corrects offenders. He's supposed to, instead of being argumentative and belligerent, he's supposed to be gentle and meek. He's supposed to have a heart of a servant. He's not to be seeking great things for himself. You see, seeking the higher position is a mark of selfish ambition, like false teachers. So he says, you need to be gentle. You need to have a meekness. Remember that Jesus described himself with meekness or in gentleness. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30, he said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. 
Paul in Ephesians 4, 1 and 2 said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. And so you ask the Lord to give you a gentle spirit. Again, he's speaking here to Timothy, who's the pastor, and he's saying to him, these are the things that will make up a pastor. You need to have these virtues and these attributes, Timothy. And by the way, in ministry, you're going to need to have faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Because in ministry, people can be difficult. People can be very difficult to work with. All of us who, who um, you know, if you're in, the, in a kind of a job that it's service-oriented, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're a server in a restaurant or a waitress at a restaurant or you work with people in whatever variety of ways in a store or whatever, people sometimes can be pretty tough. They can be very difficult, as you know. They can say rude things and act in rude ways. They can have a $300 bill and leave no tip at all, and you ended up paying for some of that because of the way it works in restaurant businesses and all. And you know that it can be hard and it's thankless and all of that. Well, you know, ministry can be very similar. And so, Timothy, you need to have a gentleness. You need to have faith. You need to have love. And you need to have patience. Because if you're going to minister to people, you need to remember that uh, sheep may not be dangerous, but they can bite. And sometimes be aware of that, because that's what happens. So he's giving to him a contrast of what a false teacher is like and what a genuine teacher is like. And then he moves on into verse 12 by saying this, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And so he moves on to speak about a fight of faith. When he says, fight the good fight of faith, that literally can be said, agonize the good agony. To fight speaks of being involved in Greek athletic contest. It speaks of contending for a crown. It eventually began to mean to fight or contend with an adversary. So he's saying, keep contending for the faith, even as you continue pursuing these virtues. Fight a virtuous warfare. Fight in a noble fashion, because it's a war for men's souls. And Timothy, exert every ounce of your energy to win. Do not put your life on cruise control. Do not coast towards heaven. And I say that to all of us. Some of us are closer to heaven's door than others. My pastor Chuck Smith, when he went home to be with the Lord, I was there at his last Sunday morning service. Marie and I, my wife and I, went to the third service there at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, sat in one of the rows up in the front, on the edge, on the aisle seat. When my pastor came out to speak, you know, I locked eyes with him. I wanted him to know I was there to support him because I knew that for him, the days were closing in for him to go to be with Jesus. And I wanted to be there with him. So I remember that very well, how he gave his study. It was a great study out of the book of Romans. And, and then I got a text message uh, a couple days later, Pastor Chuck is in heaven. That was the text message. Chuck is in heaven. Do you know that my pastor was preparing a Bible study during the week because he was fully determined that he was going to be in the pulpit teaching the Word of God for the next study that he was supposed to do, that he died, literally died in the saddle, literally died preparing a Bible study. I told Chuck a long time ago, I said, Pastor, I said, you're a terrible example to me. And he said, what do you mean? I said, you know, there are so many good things that you're an example of that are good, Chuck, but you're a terrible example in one thing. And he said, and what is that? I said, you, you didn't teach me how to retire. You never have. You never have. And he laughed about that, but that was Pastor Chuck. He said, Dave, he said, what could be better than serving Jesus Christ? What could be better than that? And that's a fact. That's a fact. And so he died at, a, at a, an old age, but he died, you know, to see him walk out with his oxygen tank and to see the frailty of this man 
that I loved so deeply. But to see the faith in this man to the very end, he wanted to, he wanted to break the tape with his chest. He didn't want to hobble through. He wanted to move through, and he did. He entered in that way. And we should not be those who coast into heaven. We shouldn't be. We ought to press in. We ought to, we ought to go for the prize. And that's what he's saying. Fight the good fight of faith. Contend for it. Hold fast to it. Don't give up. Don't coast. Take as many with you to heaven as you can to the last minute. That's what you're supposed to do. And that's what Christianity is. It's a good fight. It's a, it, he's saying agonize the good agony. Keep contending for the faith. Continue pursuing these virtues. Fight the warfare that's virtuous. Use every ounce of your energy and win. Do not put your life on cruise control. Do not coast towards heaven. Finish well. You need to recognize that the Christian life is filled with spiritual warfare. There are traps. Therefore, be on the alert. Our lives are filled with spiritual landmines. How do I know that? Well, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16 tells us that. Paul said, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. That word circumspectly, it's a word that speaks of being on your hands and your knees on the lookout for danger. The word circumspectly speaks of being watchful, cautious, alert for danger. To walk circumspectly means to be able to discern enemies. It tells us that the world we live in is a dangerous place. Don't forget it. You are walking in a place filled with spiritual landmines. Landmines that will cripple you. So be aware at all times because you can walk into a trap. Walk circumspectly. That means walk straight. Walk straight in the center of God's Word. Deuteronomy 5.32 says, Therefore, you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. And he says in Ephesians 5.15, We do not walk as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. When he says we do not walk as fools, that word fool simply speaks of that which is without wisdom or acting unintelligently or irresponsibly. The fool is the one who acts as if there is no God. And so without faith in God, the fool creates his own rules. And the rules he creates are established to excuse or to make acceptable his sin and his error. That's what they do. In Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Isaiah 5, 20 and 21 says, Woe unto those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. We have that today, where people are redefining everything that you grew up believing, redefining it. If you think it, if you feel it, it must be true. That's the way of a fool. They're redefining in order to give themselves freedom to create their own rules and live that way. But the Christian walks circumspectly because we're not fools. We're wise. As children of God, we walk appropriately. We've been made alive in Jesus Christ. So we can walk in the wisdom that results from abiding in the Lord and abiding in His Word. He says in Ephesians 5.16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming speaks of purchasing. We redeem the time. The word time speaks of that which is measured or allocated. It speaks of a fixed period of time. God has set boundaries for your life. Our opportunities are within those boundaries. So make best use of your time. When I got saved, I came home. It was December 27, 1970. I came home. First thing I did is I went across the street to some friend's house. I was going to share with them about the Lord. They weren't there, but their mom was there and two or three sisters. And I shared with them and I said, I gave my heart to Christ tonight. I gave my heart to the Lord. I'm a brand new person in Jesus Christ. I redeemed the time. I went across the street I told my mom and my dad, you know, I said, you know, I love you, praise the Lord. And 
shared with my sisters. And my sister Madeline went, home, went, went to bed that night, gave her heart to Christ. So from the beginning, I wanted to redeem the time. I, I wanted to learn to buy back the moments because I grew to understand that my life has a certain boundaries allocated to me and certain opportunities that the Lord will give me within those boundaries. And therefore, I'm supposed to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling, working within those boundaries. We have been bought by Jesus Christ. We have an allotted time. So he's saying, be wise and use it well. We Christians need to be aware that each moment we have is a gift. We should use time wisely. James chapter 4, verse 14 asks the question, What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. You climb out of the shower in the morning, it's cool in the room, and the vapor settles on the, uh, on the mirror, and that's when you look your best, by the way, but the vapor is on the mirror, and then eventually it just fades away. And he's saying that is your life. That's the duration of it. You have friends who have died and you say they were so young because it seems that they were because life is that quick. And he's saying you need to realize that you've been purchased. You have an allotted time. Use your time well. We redeem it because we're living in the last days and these days are evil. The word evil can speak of uh, hardship, pain, or trouble. But it also speaks of that which is wicked or bad. And he's saying these evil times are actively opposed to the Lord, his message, as well as his messengers. We have little time left, but we have much opposition. Being called by God places you in the midst of spiritual combat. When you're saved, you are automatically a member of the Lord's armed forces. And that puts you in the position of coming under spiritual attack. So be prepared for the battle. Don't, do not be surprised when it comes at you, because it does. It's again, it's Christmas. You're going to have a good time. There are times when people that are your family will let you know how they feel after they've had a few wine coolers. They will, I don't know about you, but I've been there. They'll let you know how they feel about you after they start loosening up a bit. I used to like you, man. What happened to you? One of my cousins, Ray, told me that. I used to like you. I said, I never liked you. No, he said, I used to like you. What happened to you? You used to be fun. What happened to you? Anybody here ever experienced anything like that? I have. What happened to you? You know, you used to make jokes and laugh, and, you know, and now you're what? You're a Christian. No. The days are actively opposed to you. Don't be surprised. Don't go home and cry yourself to sleep because grandma got mad. It's, it's to be expected. Don't respond. Don't retaliate. Don't be angry. Don't tell them off. Just understand. That's what happens. That's Christianity. You stepped into the Lord's side and the world is actively opposed to him. The days are evil. And when you open your mouth and you express your opinion, which I've done many times, not just in church, but in classes and in conversations, when people will get mad at me because I'm a Christian, I've had people mad at me without me saying a word to them about Christ. I'm sitting on a train, a woman's next to me. She asks me, uh, what do you do? Well, actually, she's telling me she's, uh, she sings songs. She's, she called them body, B-A-W-D. B-A-W-D-Y, body songs, dirty songs, bar songs. She tell me that. Because I said, what are you doing here? Because we're in Europe. She, I, what are you doing here? She goes, oh, I, I, I sing dirty songs in bars. I, I didn't say anything to her. I didn't say, can you sing me one? I didn't, <laughs> I didn't say anything. I just, oh, you know, mm, okay. And she's telling me all about it. All about it. Yeah, and I blah, blah, blah. And I'm just sitting there just politely listening. She goes, what do you do? I said, this, is, this was my answer. I said, I'm a pastor. That's all I said. I'm a pastor. She looks at me and she says, I hated when people preached to me. And I'm just looking at her. I didn't say a word. I hadn't said a word. 
I'm just looking at her. I hate it when people preach at me. I said, really? She goes, yeah, I hate it. I said, but it's okay for you to preach to other people, right? She goes, what do you mean? I never preach. I said, yes, you do. I said, your philosophy is all through this world. What do you mean you don't preach? What do you mean by that? She says, when do I preach at you? I said, when do you preach at me? Every time I see a commercial on TV, every time I hear a song on the radio, every time I watch a movie that's on TV, every time I pass a billboard on a highway, you are preaching to me. Your message is out there 24-7. You are constantly arguing your message. But me, I tell you I'm a pastor and I'm preaching to you. See, that's the way it is. That's how people are. I happen to be somebody who doesn't have a problem talking to you. You want to talk? We'll talk. We'll talk. So what? You're going to kill me? Sing one of your dirty songs? I don't care. <laughs> but, the, but the bottom line is, that's what happens. These days are actively opposed. Have you seen it? Have you, it is actively opposed. Okay, I'm going to say something you're going to get mad about. Maybe, maybe not. I don't care. Merry Christmas. Here's your present. No, it's true. It's an observation. I never expected the world to say Merry Christmas to me anyway. I really didn't. Why would I expect somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ wish me blessings from Christ? I've never really thought that. But I did grow up in a time when that was appropriate, it was right, and nobody made issues over it. So I'm, I'm watching it for years, as people will not say it. Suddenly it's happy holidays, and I begin to ask myself, what holiday are you talking about? I mean, let's be real. I mean, what holiday are you talking about? Do you think I'm Jewish? I'm not celebrating Hanukkah. What other holiday are you talking about? They just couldn't bring themselves to say, I mean, I'm not expecting the world again. I'm not expecting the world to bless me. Why would I? But at the same time, I realize there's an antichrist spirit where you start taking Jesus out of Christmas and you replace him with some baby in a manger. We need to remember that that baby in the manger grew up to embrace a cross. He was placed in a manger but put on a cross. There was a reason for the birth of Jesus Christ and that's why I say Merry Christmas because Jesus Christ was born that he may die that I might have eternal life through him. That's Christmas. You see, But I don't expect the world to believe that. I just know that that's what it is, right? And so we get upset, and we say, oh, but now I'm watching, and you can hate or, or not hate. I think we need to respect the office of the president, and we have to be careful the way that we speak about him. But I do appreciate this one thing, at least, that he's saying, you know what, Merry Christmas. I'm hearing that so many times, I'm saying, that's a good thing. That is a good thing. Let's remember our heritage, right? And so the bottom line is this world is in opposition against even acknowledging the birth of Jesus Christ, let alone the reason for it. And so why would I think the world is going to be in favor of me? Paul is saying, fight the good fight of faith. He's saying, you walk circumspectly on your knees looking for the landmines because the days are actively opposed to you and they're intended for evil. Therefore, be aware of this. The, <coughs> you as a soldier must be prepared for battle, and you need to be prepared for battle at all times. And so he says, fight the good fight of faith. The good fight of faith is spiritual in nature. In 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight... Uh, fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Paul in Ephesians 6, 12, and 13 said, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So we have armor that we're to wear in this fight. We have the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Our loins are girded with truth. 
Our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. This, these are the weapons of our warfare. And we're aware that we're in spiritual battle, and thus we war, but we do not lose. When he says after doing all, having done it all, he said to stand, it's not stand like we're, it means stand with our feet planted as victors, because Jesus Christ has given us victory. Jesus Christ has made us more than conquerors. The enemy, listen, cannot defeat you. He cannot beat you. Jesus Christ is king. He is the Lord. He gives us understand that. That's why you have faith. That's why you have love. That's why you have patience. That's why you pursue these things. Because we don't fight from wondering if we win. We fight because we're winners already in Jesus Christ. It's done. It is finished. We are more than conquerors because of him. So stand as victors. Stand bloody, maybe, but unbowed because we won in Jesus Christ. That's what we need to know. That's where people are failing today because they're acting as if the devil won. He's a liar. He's a liar. He didn't win. He lost. Jesus crushed his head when he went on the cross. It's over. We won. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I will see his face one day, and I will say, thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. That's called Christianity. That's the Christian faith. Understand it. That's Christianity. We need to understand that we lay hold of eternal life. We're not running for short-lived fame. We're not running for comfort. We're running for eternal reward. That's what our battle's all about. And we are to take it seriously. It's been said, many who start off well do not end well because they don't have what it takes. They simply are unwilling to pay the price. The flesh, the world, everyday affairs, personal interests, and often simple laziness hinder spiritual growth and preparation for service. And that is true. I've heard enough professional fighters say this, that I'll quote what I've heard over the years, and they have said this. I've heard many say this. Many of you have heard this also. They said, if you go into the ring, if you go into the fight expecting to lose, don't even go into the ring, because you will. That's why you see one, one fighter facing off another fighter, and he just keeps saying things to him. Just keeps saying, you're going to lose. I'm going to take you. It's all over. You shouldn't. They're trying to get in his head so that when he steps into the ring, he's already half lost. He has, he's going to walk in already a loser. That's why you stay in the Word of God because God's Word tells you, no, no, you're not going to lose. It may seem rough right now, and in some cases it is. Who's to say it's not? It may be tough on the job, and it may be tough in the home, and it may be discouraging as you watch your kids as they're not doing well, or your marriage isn't going the way that you want, and the enemy whispers in your ear in one form or another through a friend, or something you're reading, some song you hear on the radio, overhearing a conversation somewhere in a restaurant. Give up. Let it go. Doesn't matter. Dump them. Start out fresh. Ain't going to change. No. No. I'm going to hold fast to the promises of God. Even when it looks darkness, that's when the light's going to shine the brightest. I will get through this. I am never alone. He is with me. His rod, his staff, they comfort me. Yeah, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but I will fear no evil for he is with me. I'm not alone. He's with me every step of the way. And in the time that I haven't been able to walk, he's carried me. He is faithful to do that. You hold fast. This is a battle you're in. Don't give up. The enemy is whispering in a lot of ears today to the church. You're not going to make it. It's over. Islam's on the rise. Politics are destroying one bad thing after another is being poured into the soul of America. But guess what? 
when you see these things happening, look up for your redemption draws nigh. Jesus is even closer now than ever before. That's why we battle from the position of the victor. We have won in Jesus Christ. We will continue forward. We're not going to give up. The gates of hell will not, will not be able to overcome the church. He said, and finally, he says, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. You are called and you've confessed the good confession. Remember that you have before witnesses promised to follow God to the very end. In Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, whoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. I've had people ask me, how, how, how have you remained faithful to the Lord for 47 years? I haven't always been solid. God knows that. I haven't always followed straight the way that I should. I've had many, many, many times of stumbling and struggling. I would be a hypocrite and a liar if I said anything but that. That's true. But you see, I made a, I made a vow to God. I, made, I confessed that good, that good confession before many witnesses. When I got saved, there were about 4,000 people there. Ten of us stood up at the invitation. I made a confession of faith before many witnesses. I said, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. And for me, I knew that when you make a promise to a man, that matters something. But when you, when you make a promise to God, that matters even more. I've been married to my, my beloved for a long time now, my, my, my Marie. And I was made a promise to her in front of the minister, in front of the best man and maid of honor in front of our parents and in front of the invited guests. I made a promise to her that I would love her and that I would be faithful to her for the rest of my life. And I have been. I've never been unfaithful to her and I've only grown to love her more every day. Every day. Because of the power of Christ in me. But I know I made a promise to her in front of man, but the thing that motivates that, pro that promise has been, I made my oath to my God. And when I got saved, I made a promise to my God. I confessed him before men, and I said, I will follow you to the very end. And it, again, it's true. I, I haven't always been the best witness. When I've fallen, I've gotten up, and I've gone forward, and I will go forward till the very end when I see him face to face, when I see the eyes that wept for me in the garden, when I see the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world, and I will hear him say, oh, enter into the joy of your Lord, my good and my faithful servant. This has been prepared for you, and I will walk in. Why? Because that is my heart. I will follow Jesus Christ to the end, and you will too. We need to follow him completely. That's called Christianity. That's called Christianity. Not a popular message today, by the way. But that is the message of the cross. Hold fast. Look up. Your Redeemer's coming at any moment. Let us be prepared.